sure appreciate being here today. It's a great forum to interact. Uh, Robert Wells has already set the stage of the importance in genetics and that underlying contribution to overall value and profit. We're going to break that down a little bit, bit more today as we go through a few slides. We want to talk about some of the technology that's being used today uh, from uh, both the seed stock side of the business and, and some of the future uh, tools that will be available uh, commercially, I think, as we look down the road to really help uh, propel uh, production in beef cattle, in the beef cattle business. I guess real quickly, uh, just to get a sense, uh, Neil, I, I was curious, how many uh, folks here are in the seed stock business? Uh, if you could just raise your hand a little bit. Others are involved in the commercial industry, uh, I would assume. Then uh, again, we, we appreciate and we're going to try to try to cover some ground on, on both fronts. Uh, you know, I think uh, beef cattle production has really continued to evolve, and and again, the the importance of of knowing what you've got, being able to analyze and understand what you need to make improvements is is very important. And I mean, we look at things like uh, the crop industry, farming industry, and just some of the technological advances and the use of the data that's there to make improvements and to really uh, get into specified production when you have goals and targets and being able to use that information, the tools available, to really, uh, to really hone in on, on how to improve uh, production and, and meet the targets that you've got for your operation. One of the bonuses of talking about uh, genomics and its incorporation into selection tools and genetic evaluations as we go through this, you'll see it's quite seamless now. So there can be genomic contributions to systems of expected progeny differences or EPDs as many of you all utilize those in your program already. Uh, historically, we've seen uh, species, progressive species, and swine, poultry, dairy have incorporated these genomic tools into their selection uh, strategies, uh, selection indexes as well. And then, of course, Charlet was one of the leaders in uh, beef selection index. So now what we'll talk about today is the seamless incorporation of a, a DNA test, for example, and the genomic contribution. To, to bring this into perspective, I think it's nice to do just a short review of some of the uh, concepts to, to keep in mind. Uh, we're interested in genetics or we wouldn't be here. And the traits that we measure have a genetic component and an environment component. We try to figure out what that genetic variation piece is. And some rules of thumb to keep in mind, uh, your carcass traits highly heritable, reproductive traits more lowly heritable, the growth traits that we've talked about, uh, we've heard uh, Robert reference um, earlier today, uh, moderately heritable. Uh, the higher the heritability, the more effective uh, you can make selection progress. And uh, the low heritability traits are a little more challenging. You have to have lots of data. That's why we don't see quite as many uh, selection tools for reproduction as perhaps sometimes that we like. Carcass traits are nice to, to work with. Uh, selection can be quite effective. Just to give you another example, okay, we're measuring variation. We want to know what the genetic piece is as illustrated in this pie chart in blue. Um, for uh, weaning weight, uh, that could be about 30% due to genetics. And so you've got 70% due to environment. And so you can have an impact on management, creep, no creep, uh, age of dam, calf age. Those are just some of some statistical adjustments we make as well to try to develop uh, genetic tools, your weaning weight, EPD, for example. So that's just a, a breakout to keep in mind. You know, I think, again, when, as Robert described, uh, we, we see populations of, of cattle that we are able to make some drastic improvement uh, through genetic selection. And it's not that we're, we're changing necessarily the variation due to genetics uh, within that population, but we're just trying to move that, that average or that benchmark higher as we go. And so I think, uh, 
as he indicated, uh, just some, some honed in selection uh, of the traits of interest, you can really make some rapid progress. Uh, right, you can collect weaning weights on the one herd to the left and plot that normal distribution. You'll hear people call it a bell-shaped curve. And so those are ni nice traits to work with, uh, the lower hanging fruit. Uh, the curve on the right, uh, more progressive in terms of that average phenotypic or weight, weaning weight performance. And again, as Bill mentioned, we're trying to move that mean, so we want to drill down and find the genetic piece and sort out the environmental nuisance and try to make that directional progress. And so from a traditional standpoint, if we went back to 19, late 70s, 1980, a traditional genetic evaluation when the first weaning weight, yearling weight, EPDs really became uh, available for us as selection tools, you would take your performance data, your weights and measures in a proper contemporary group, those set of calves managed and treated alike, and then you'd take some pedigree resource, and we could look at any breed or database to try to generate the expected progeny differences and an associated accuracy with those. So those were the, the key driving pieces. We also needed to know the heritability for the trait, and that's an important um, cog in the wheel of making the math work. We also use that pedigree to account for the merit of mates, a positive assortative mating. If you have good mated to good or good mated to bad, you're able to do that through those pedigree relationships as well. So what are we trying to do big picture? is moving the mean and so this or the average and this is just an example of when you're working with EPDs you're looking at how future offspring or progeny are expected to perform and so you're trying to use this genetic prediction and so the key part is to look at a difference so if you subtract the 30 from the 50 pound EPD that you see printed somewhere on the average you'd expect that 20 pound difference in weaning weight in future offspring out of those two sires. And that's been documented quite extensively for various traits. Uh, Clay Center, Larry Keene, uh, USDA, uh, they look to see, you know, if you're using an EPD, are you really getting what you're expecting? And so that's been reviewed over the years. So uh, we feel confident in that uh, classic genetic evaluation procedure. And we just use one trait. We could do carcass traits here, uh, calving ease, growth traits as well. Again, uh, the basics that you all I'm sure most are familiar with, but just really setting the, the stage for, for kind of what's moving in the future. And again, how to use those EPDs. Uh, we know the, uh, the averages or they provide the benchmark, so to speak, of, of kind of where the breed, where the population is. And so it's important to be able to access and know what those average EPDs are, uh, percentile rankings then give you, a, give you a sense within that population uh, where that animal might fit in that population. And so if uh, weaning weight's uh, my number one uh, priority, I know that I can, uh, I can go in and maybe I'm, I'm looking at those, those top 20 uh, percentile uh, bulls for, for weaning EPD, I need to be kind of in that 35 uh, plus 35 uh, pounds for weaning weight. If I know I really need some improvement in that area in my herd, I can get up in the upper 10%, 5%, upper percentiles when I'm doing that. Always important to remember uh, the numeric EPDs or an index value, they're, they're really just comparable within that population. And so if you're looking at different breeds uh, within the programs you're working with or or, or trying to understand how EPDs fit together, look at them within that population and then use the percentile rankings really rather than the absolute numbers. And with the group we have here today, we've got uh, registered and commercial producers here as well. Uh, you all become the elite, uh, train the trainers in a sense. And so the first thing when someone puts a piece of paper in your face and says, look at my EPDs, first thing you want to think, okay, what breeds are we looking at? You're probably looking at Charlay. What uh, class of animals? Let's try to get some idea of a breed average or, you know, are these non-parents? Are they looking at AI sires? And then hone in on those relative rankings to help us make those 
decisions. So you become the trainers of these concepts as well. Uh, this is just a slide I got from uh, Larry Keene at, at Clay Center, USDA, because it's interesting, every year at BIF, um, he updates these tables, and so just to, to get your perspective, he grabs the genetic trend values for all the various breeds. I just have the ones you're probably most familiar with down here at the, at the bottom and plots the line. Now that gray line working towards the right at the top is the, the Charlet line. And you'll notice um, in terms of genetic trend, all the breeds have made quite a bit of progress in terms of direct growth. In this example, weaning weight, we could put another chart up for yearling weight and it looked very similar to this. And so I think a nice take home message is we've made genetic progress in our breeds by using these selection tools using the EPDs. And another part that's uh, important to remember is uh, today in terms of specializing genetics for a certain market or value, uh, you, you need to set your breed apart because you do have other breeds that can also make achievements in terms of weight and direct growth. Is that kind of how you set that up, Bill? And so I think that's where we see the value of, of really going the next step and, and trying to further enhance these tools. And in the last eight to ten years, you've, you've started to hear a lot of buzzwords within the industry associated with, with EPDs and with genetic selection. We talk about genomic enhanced EPDs or GE EPDs. We talk about different... Uh, different trait tests that, that started being available about 15 years ago probably in terms of, of some individual uh, markers that were identified that uh, at one time were thought to be very effective to make selection uh, improvement, but as it turned out, they really weren't accounting for very much variation. So we're gonna look at some of the different methodologies that's, that's helped uh, incorporate some of that genomic technology as that industry has begun to mature now and we've got some better information to utilize. And again it's important that there's buzzwords out there but the key take-home point is that the genomic piece can be incorporated seamlessly into the EPDs and indexes so you utilize those just like you always, always have. It's an additional piece of information. And so depicted here, if you think back, we looked at the traditional genetic evaluation that had performance data and pedigree. So let's take this a step further and incorporate the genomic piece in as well. And as a breed, you already have genomic enhanced EPDs, and you see that on the website lookup with the, the logo indicating that. And in terms of buzzwords, the way that your current uh, genomic piece is incorporated is through molecular breeding values, or you'll see MBB sometimes on that. So you're not utilizing the molecular breeding values out of the Charlet calibration that was designed years ago. Instead, you're incorporating that into the EPD system and utilizing the EPDs rather than that component piece. You want to try to use as much of the information available in those genetic predictions, and that's laid out for you through your national cattle evaluation procedures. So that's the current setup um, in terms of a correlated trait approach using those molecular breeding values. So big picture in terms of DNA test, um, we think of those as being available in registered seed stock and uh, to a lesser extent in the commercial component, although breed organizations have begun to offer some, some commercial testing as well. And so I think we'll see continued growth in opportunities for commercial cattle. Uh, there's also genomic companies that have tests as well, trait tests, percentile ranks, and different uh, pieces there. In terms of the commercial cow herd, it's just some big picture items here. Uh, the contribution of a commercial producer to arrive at these tests may just be uh, a DNA sample, some biological material, blood or hair, and the amount of uh, work, I guess, required in terms of data submission can vary. Uh, cost range bills, that's about right, 20 to 
80 up into the registered piece. Uh, what we've learned in uh, human health has, and that technology has tended to drive those prices down more affordable uh, for livestock. Uh, parentage, you can arrive at that, 15 to 18 dollars in a lot of cases for commercial options for parentage. And there may be even volume discounts applied. You need to be really uh, conscientious on commercial applications for uh, genomic results or read the fine line, interpretation of results, whether these are, are rankings or uh, EPDs or some sort of selection index. So as a purebred breeder, you have a real, I mean, it's a, it's a head start by being able to incorporate that, that DNA technology into the traditional geno or genetic evaluation, the EPDs and indexes that you're used to using. And just, again, you're building uh, increased accuracy. I think Robert said it quite well earlier in, in talking about young bulls that that now use, utilizing genomics in those predictions, it's like having that first calf crop on, on that bull and being able to evaluate uh, his EPDs and, and accuracy values kind of at that level. And so it's, it's given us an opportunity to really help uh, advance some of these selections that, that allow that genetic trend to continue to increase and in, improve over time. Well, one of the value pieces of the Charlet breed is, is your database. And so that phenotypic weights and measures, pedigree information, and now the genomic contribution, uh, genotypes and amassing that volume lets you compute a national cattle evaluation, which is much more detailed than a kitchen table or trait test type approach. So what we'll do next is kind of hit some highlights of opportunities and how the genomics figures into that. We already said in terms of sire selection, we have national cattle evaluation procedures that seamlessly incorporates the genomic uh, tests that, that you and others have purchased to enhance that predictability of your seed stock and then on to the commercial piece. We'll mention a little bit of the cowherd selection, replacement female opportunities now and that what will evolve in the future to add value. So most of you all are familiar with online searches just in general. The backdrop is the search that you're probably familiar with um, on the Charlet website. These searches are readily available and that's a wonderful opportunity for you to do searches, filtering on accuracies, different sorts by traits, and, and making your uh, calling levels or criteria for your breeding program. And so this is a nice tool available. Sally, I think the important thing is, I mean, we know that through uh, improved sire selection, I mean, we're really, uh, we're looking at being able to impact probably 80% of the genetics, I think I've heard in, in terms of just the sire selection piece. And so we, a commercial producer uh, can make tremendous progress by using uh, highly accurate bulls, uh, bulls that excel at the traits of interest that he's interested in. And, and that has been tremendous uh, technology uh, that they've had at their fingertips. But again, we keep looking down the road how we can continue to make improvements. As we go. Right, beyond just the sire component, if replacements are retained, you're right, you would, would get up more into that 75, 80 percent of genetic contribution over a generation interval uh, of a cow herd, commercial cow herd as well. Uh, this is just an example of looking for a sire selector component on the, the Charlet website. Again, if you haven't accessed these tools, and, and then again, always we're open to uh, good improvements, implementation, sorting differences, suggestions that you might have. So, uh, we kind of glossed over a selection index. Again, Charlet has that terminal sire index that's available. Why selection indexes? Well, that's taking a set of EPDs and boiling those down into a single value, typically reported in dollars, because as producers, we, we like to talk about dollars. It's a nice unit to work with. 
multi-trade in design, uh, complicated to design, but sim simple to use. You're going to utilize these like you do EPDs and setting up a relative ranking and, and choosing animals as well. And these were actually uh, established for commercial bull buyers, bid mine, to help simplify the laundry list of EPDs and boiling that out down into one number. Again, not rocket science in terms of the initial work was done in, in swine back in the 40s. Our poultry, poultry industry has a significant uh, intellectual property in their indexes. Swine does as well. Dairy has some nice indexes to incorporate reproductive traits in as well as their key yield traits. And uh, beef cattle breeds have uh, sure made a charge at indexes as well. Of course, indexes, you've got EPDs that are economically weighted. The EPDs have the genomics in them, so this all filters into that ultimate index value. Yeah, the, the neat thing that, as Sally mentioned earlier, the Charlet uh, Association would have kind of been the leaders in, in index development in the beef cattle side. They're, they have the ability uh, as well to, to customize or, or put some additional inputs uh, for your operation that, that allow you to, to make those indexes. Uh, something that can work for your operation as well as the, as the standalone indexes. Are yeah, the customization. I mean, early on, the scary thing about putting an index was like, oh my goodness, it's going to have the units of dollars, and how are, are people going to react to having a selection tool with that as the units? But now it's, it's commonly acceptable. So, commonly accepted. So if we shift gears and think about in terms of commercial cow herd selection tools, and again we, we kind of think in terms of the replacement female side of the business and, and people that are that are putting replacements back into their their herd. I mean we heard Robert talk about benchmarks uh, that included some of the economics and the profit side of the business. And, and we can see also benchmarks just from the phenotypic data that you gather from your operation uh, related to various performance measures and performance levels. And these have been kind of the traditional information that was initially available, Sally, for yeah. commercial cow calf Weaning producers. percentage, pounds of calf weaning per cow exposed, and, and we just used uh, Chris Ringwald, North Dakota State, and CHAPS as an example here, but we're standing really close to the uh, thinking of the history of the integrate, integrated resource management programs and SPA, standardized performance analysis. Some of you all in here have a history with that, and Jim McGrann at, at Texas A&M, for example. So that would have been another example that had economic pieces in it and phenotypic performance uh, tied to the commercial cow-calf operations. A great history there, but uh, what do we do with all the data, Bill? Right. I mean, I think the challenge that we, we run into, and I mean, again, Robert talked about the, the, the having amassed tremendous amounts of information and data and really not understanding how to utilize that information. And from a genetic standpoint, we find commercial producers that are in the same ballpark uh, with the genetics in their herd. They may have individual performance records or group performance records for their herd. They may have uh, carcass data or they've retained ownership in those cattle and got uh, feedlot performance and, and grid uh, performance from a carcass value standpoint. And, and how they utilize that information to tie it back to the cow herd to know how that herd's working in their environment and, and under their management system and, and really how to make decisions moving forward. And so we recognize the opportunity uh, exists as we look down the road for, for more commercial producers to utilize some of the genetic uh, genomic tools that are out there to utilize some of their data and to, to meld that information into uh, more genetic selection tools that they can make improvement in their operations as well. And this probably sets the stage for a lot of the content that will follow that we'll get into the panels and the discussion. You'll see our participants and how they utilize their, their data. 
We had a good outline from Dr. Wells on this already, and so that set the stage for the profit component of this as well. Yeah, and we're trying to understand how, as a commercial producer, how can I take the genetics of my operation and really increase the value in my, in my uh, operation, the outputs of my operation. Rex, you're very familiar in, in Missouri. We've had the Show Me Select heifer program that really was initially built as a, as a reproduction experiment, I guess, but they, they encouraged the use of high accuracy AI sires in that, uh, in that project. And, and as it's moved on, it's identifying or characterizing the genetics represented in those replacement heifers that sell and and now uh, Jared Decker is working there at the University of Missouri with that program and they've started now uh, using genomic tests and to help better characterize the genetic merit of those females and uh, information he reported uh, last year for the program the heifers that were actually genomic tested uh, received kind of a $400 premium over the non-tested heifers in that program. And so we're, we've talked a long time about genomics being utilized in the commercial uh, sector and, and is there value or are there premiums associated with that. This is just an example that we pull out to, to kind of show you some of the things that are happening in the utilization of genomics as we go forward. And we're going to follow this with some additional examples, some in place, some to keep you forward thinking in terms of the synergy or building those relationships between seed stock supplier and commercial herds and the bull buying and the DNA piece to help bring those databases together more and more in the future, those genetic connections. I think one of the things that uh, we, we look at is the tremendous opportunity to start tying the information like Robert and, and their program are gathering from a commercial <coughs> basis to tie that back to the seed stock and, and be able to uh, really prove, I guess, the value of the genetic uh, inputs uh, from a seed stock standpoint, improving, ultimately you have the opportunity to improve uh, the genetic predictions uh, back to the seed stock sector as well by tying into some of that commercial information. The dairy industry has kind of relied oh, on yeah. that. I mean, and that's how their, to do. their evaluations have really been built, right, Rex? Yeah. <laughs> we got to say it was easier for the dairy people. <laughs> it's more regular. I wouldn't say it's any easier. Yeah. Okay. So, how does this work? So again, your genetic evaluation procedures, national cattle evaluation, we're just recapping here. You're combining data simultaneously. Your phenotypes, weights, measures, scans, available pedigree, you're used to seeing, say, three or four generation pedigree on web interfaces, on your uh, registration papers. The genomic piece, more readily accessible. We're going to talk a little bit about incorporating that genotype directly in a single step fashion, which the Charlet breed is working towards uh, adopting that uh, technology in future national cattle valuations. Um, we'll give you a little commercial spin on that as well. Um, added bonus when you're working with genotypes, the parentage SNPs are on there too. So that's an actual bonus for the commercial herds in identifying the specific sires, leaving their genetic mark on those calf crops. It works in commercial data as well as our seed stock populations. So again at the top from left to right, your performance data, you get that, the weights. A little bit different twist incorporating those genotypes directly. You'll hear the word single step genetic evaluation or one step and your traditional pedigree. Those genotypes utilizing uh, SNPs or those little DNA markers depicted on the right, the A's, the T's, the C's, the G's, we won't bog down on that. But using that genotype pattern you can actually build a genomic pedigree. So this is a step beyond uh, the correlated trait or molecular breeding values that are utilized in your current um, Charlotte National Cattle Evaluation. 
So this work will begin to evolve here in the next few months. No calibration, genomic pedigree, big picture, the genomics are in the EPDs. You use the EPDs as you always have, but you can take these concepts to learn more about the commercial cow-calf herds as well. So this is just a little example of some folks that we work with uh, that have uh, actually a commercial herds that uh, run a genomic single-step genetic evaluation. So it's utilizing the pedigree information and some of the performance data and you can actually generate some EPDs and selection indexes uh, for those uh, commercial females so that they have the opportunity to make selection decisions on those. Uh, again, most of them that we work with are, are looking at it from a benchmark standpoint. So they want to know where they, where they fit with relative to the other herds and the other populations uh, for some of these traits. And the neat thing is that you can now see producers who may want to hone in that I need some additional carcass weight uh, to make improvement or I need uh, to, to watch uh, my ribeye areas, for example, or how I can make better genetic decisions, uh, whether it's for uh, selection on that replacement female side or the introduction on the sire side as well. Right, Robert, you mentioned the benchmarking. I mean, that is so popular now for commercial producers. Uh, they'll ask me, you know, well, I want to know how I compare to other producers like me. You know, how do I compare? And so that makes the, the benchmarking uh, much more relevant now and, and moving forward. So, so I think this is, again, this is example. kind of a, a forward-looking example, but I think you're going to see opportunities and see this technology utilized more and more across the industry uh, not only for the seed stock business but for commercial producers as well. Replacement females, uh, finding that bottom end, having an additional tool to sort off that bottom end for selection pressure uh, culling. So this is again a, an example of a herd, a commercial herd. They were uh, just an AI uh, heavy AI herd that uh, we got their historical records and we ran a genetic evaluation uh, for that herd. And so you could see it, it was pretty neat to do a genetic trend just like you saw for the Charlet breed earlier, that increase in, in weaning weight. Here's that commercial herd and just showing the progress from an EPD standpoint, not just looking at the the phenotypic measures, but looking at the EPDs and how they've made improvement over time. Because we know with moderately heritable traits, when you have that selection tool, you can make uh, progress faster on the genetic side than if you were just looking at the uh, phenotypic weights uh, before the genetic piece is known. So kind of wrapping this up so we can entertain some questions. Uh, the cattle evaluation <coughs> procedures, the modeling behind it, uh, those prediction plans are in place. Traditionally they work, now they work with the genomic piece incorporated into them as well. Uh, you have opportunity to capitalize on those DNA tests. They're becoming more and more affordable. We'll see more uptake in that moving forward for the commercial side of this as well. Uh, everyone now can access searches on their phones, so that's making those EPDs on the sire selection side even more available. I think you'll see uh, you and your customers try to gravitate toward learning more about the cow herd characterization as well. Again, good message to think about as we wrap it up is you have to think in terms of systems, being here at the Noble Research Institute and what they've done historically uh, is very much system oriented. So we definitely encourage that as well. Let's handle a couple of those questions and then uh, the other uh, prerogative of the moderator is going to be to move the break directly after this and we'll start <laughs> with the uh, producer cow calf panel right after the break. So Galen. Yes, uh, so you get the Charlet breed as much accuracy as we can on the DNA and everything. What what do we need to do to, if we went back and got a bunch of old semen for the last 30 years and different bull studs, 
can plug that into the database? Is that just to get more reliability, more accuracy? What, what's your guys' thoughts on that? Yeah, I'll, I'll try to start with, and then Sally can correct me, I My guess. My chauffeur will answer this. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I mean, I think we're in a little bit of a transition with the Charlet evaluation from a genomic standpoint as we move from the correlated trait model to a single step model but yeah Galen to to have the genomics on some of those cattle that historically uh, have a lot of phenotypic data uh, tied to them as well in the in the Charlet database then that that's going to improve the accuracy of that evaluation and, and the impact that the genomics, the positive impact that genomics can have moving forward, I guess would be my opinion. Right, and as, as costs come down on testing options, then you're going to see more testing in that lower price product. I think as an organization, you'll review to make sure that your um, highly used AI sires and donor females are represented with genotypes in that population as, as well. You know, there's a, a, a lot of legacy sires in there right now, but you're operating under a correlated trait model where you're accounting for about 9 to 10 percent of the additive genetic variance in your calibration right now. And at the time, that was good, but now you're going to progress to better technology by fitting those genotypes directly in the single step approach. And so that's what's currently under development uh, from your service provider. I think one of the plugs I will put in, and again, we've, we've watched as genomics sometime has become a replacement for phenotypic okay. measures and data. And in reality, it's exactly the opposite. We still need the, the weights, the birth weights, wing weights, yearling weights, the ultrasound measures, the carcass data on those cattle that can be sire identified. That becomes even more important as you move forward because when you, as you move away from the correlated trait approach of genomics, the phenotypic data really has a bigger impact moving forward and so it's something as a breed, you as breeders, uh, if you have uh, hesitated in sending in performance data recs, I think it becomes even more crucial than ever that that information be sent in to help contribute to the EPDs and that genomic evaluation moving forward. You know, Bill and I provide assistance in terms of taking a look at your national cattle evaluation before it goes up onto the webs, so when it comes back from your service provider, AGI, we take a, a look at that and review that. We see a lot of weaning weight data that are turned in and proper contemporary groups. That's a great thing. I'd like to see you all turn in more uh, yearling weights on those male and female calves and grow that data submission as well. I think you're going to want to do that as you move into the single step piece too. So think contemporary groups and turning in as much of that information for better characterization of those selection tools. Just to follow up, this is a lot related to the commercial side. We have a lot of commercial herds that uh, we're learning are doing the DNA testing. And uh, as you feed, uh, as we work to uh, be able to feed that kind of information in about sires and progeny, the contribution of that commercial data could be significant in uh, moving forward. Right, that is a very progressive step, and to continue to let that data flow in, oh, we're all learning together on that. I would totally agree. And I, and I think I heard that as much of BIF as any clear message from everyone is commercial data and how we get that assembled, and hopefully uh, Brett, the Beef Center, is going to help us do some of that. Exactly. Right. 